making hemp legal should have never been an issue to start with. And it should have been as easy as saying, well, let's just do what we were doing in the 1900s because hemp was a viable ag product that had many industrial uses and we stopped doing it for no good reason. We should have just rolled back the clock a little bit. Because of the approach that was taken instead of that, we now have regulatory issues around a crop that shouldn't be regulated. Producers forcing to, being forced to burn their production in Tennessee just this week, tribal producers hauled, trying to haul this product across Oklahoma getting arrested, probably as many different state regulatory mechanisms as there are states in the union for a product that's harmless. That's Zach Dugino, top administrator at USDA's Farm Service Agency. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock. And I just got back from the National Farmers Union Convention in Denver, Colorado, where I caught up with Zach Dugineau from FSA, along with Heidi Secor, who recently became FSA's State Executive Director for Pennsylvania. It was a joint interview with Zach and Heidi. We talked about the FSA's mission and how the FSA responds to the challenges that American farmers are facing. We talk regenerative ag and soil health, and of course, we talk hemp. The National Farmers Union invited me out to the convention and presented me with the Milton D. Haeckel Award for Excellence in Agricultural Journalism. Wow, it was quite an honor to be recognized at that level for the work that I do here on this very podcast and in our newspaper. Uh, But also, you know, by recognizing me, the Farmers Union is also recognizing Lancaster Farming Newspaper for the work that we do in connecting with farmers in Pennsylvania and around the country. So at the Farmers Union Convention, I got to talk to farmers from all over the country, and it was a really wonderful experience. So while I was there, I was able to meet a few other people of interest here on our podcast. I caught up with Colorado Commissioner of Agriculture, Kate Greenberg, and was able to ask her a few questions about him. I also met Montana Senator John Tester and was able to ask him a quick question about hemp. So we'll hear that too in a bit. And just a heads up, the sound quality of these interviews isn't always up to my normal standards. It's uh, sometimes hard to get good quality audio when you're recording on the fly, so please bear with me. I appreciate your patience and understanding in that regard. So anyway, we're going to take a quick sponsor break, and then we'll get into some nuggets of hemp news and then into our interviews. This episode is brought to you in part by King's Agri-Seeds. King's Agri-Seeds wants to remind you that all farming is local and that they've been screening products for local adaptation since 1993. Using the research farm in Christiana, Pennsylvania, King's is working to ensure seed varieties are fit for the East. Hemp is no different. Whether you're growing for grain, fiber, or CBD, King's Agri-Seeds has you covered. This episode is brought to you in part by Impactful Ventures an investment and incubation company focused on supporting startups and other initiatives that play a vital role in reversing the adverse effects of climate change. They strive to amplify enterprises which bring innovative green opportunities to the forefront and empower those making a significant impact for a sustainable future. You can learn more at mpactfulventures.org. And finally, this episode is also brought to you in part by IND Hemp in Montana, where they are seeking a senior accountant slash assistant controller to join the rapidly scaling hemp oilseed and fiber processing business based in Fort Benton, Montana. They're looking to bring on someone who is analytical with a high level of initiative and a natural sense of ownership. So if that's you, you want to get in touch, you want to move to Montana, you want to go be part of something amazing out there in Montana, and you happen to be good at math, they're looking for you. So you can learn more at indhemp.com and tell them Eric sent you. All right, before we get into our news nuggets for this week of March the 3rd, let me first just give a shout out to a listener that I met in Denver, a guy by the name of Ray DePriest. He not only listens to our show in Alaska, but he grows hemp in Alaska. So it was great to talk to him and hear about the challenges of growing hemp at 62 degrees north. All right, so we do have a bunch of hemp news nuggets to cover this week. So uh, let's just get right into it. Here's a story coming out of Tennessee. This is on newschannel5.com. 
It says that hemp farmers across Tennessee are having to destroy their hemp crop that tested over the new federal THC limit. So basically what the issue here is that uh, Tennessee hemp farmers had been operating under you know the old rules where it was Delta 9 THC that they had to keep below 0.3 percent but with the new USDA rule in effect it's total THC at 0.3 percent so according to the Department of Agriculture in Tennessee 42 percent of crops are being found non-compliant with this requirement hey maybe we should come up with some new regulations that don't force farmers to waste their time and money just a thought Okay, here's a story on feednavigator.com that says that the U.S. Hemp Feed Coalition has expressed frustration over what it perceives as unnecessary and costly holdups in U.S. federal review of hemp feed ingredients. The nonprofit organization was reacting to a letter last month from the Association of American Feed Control officials, the AAFCO, among others, calling on U.S. state leaders and lawmakers to support scientific research to ensure the safety of hemp as an animal feed ingredient prior to any federal or state approval. This is a bigger story than we've got time for here this week on News Nuggets, but I've read the letter from the Hemp Feed Coalition, and uh, here's just one part I want to share with you. Um, the Hemp Feed Coalition says that the letter that the AAFCO wrote is deliberately conflating hemp grain with cannabinoids, greatly setting back the years of progress the industry has made educating our colleagues in the traditional agricultural world on how the parts of the plant differ and the highly nutritious value that hemp grain brings. Right, so basically, that's why we need education here, because they are viewing hemp grain through the lens of a drug, and they think that the cannabinoids are going to get into, you know, the feed supply. But that's not how it works. You know, they've, they've done plenty of research on the hemp grain, and th there's no THC there. No one is going to get high from eating your hemp hearts, and your, your cattle are not going to get high from eating hemp seeds, all right? So we need more education, and I'm, I'm really glad that the Hemp Feed Coalition is, is making this known. Um, so next week we are going to have an interview with, with somebody from the Hemp Feed Coalition to dig into this a little bit further. All right, this next story is from Lancaster Farming Newspaper. The headline reads, 3D Printing Construction Company to Build with Hemp in Pennsylvania. It's written by my colleague, Phil Gruber. And the story says that Pennsylvania's hemp supply chain is taking a major step as a next generation construction company sets up research and manufacturing operations in Monroe County. Black Buffalo 3D Corporation plans to use hemp fiber in the cement-based mix it uses to 3D print buildings. The company will assemble the industrial scale printers, develop products, and train customers on a 106 acre site it has purchased in Smithfield Township, just outside of East Stroudsburg. Regular listeners might remember the name Black Buffalo. We talked about it with Jeff Whaling from the National Hemp Association back in October. This next story is out of South Dakota from the Aberdeen News. Headline reads Industrial hemp processing is coming to South Dakota. The story says that hemp growers in South Dakota are expecting to more than double the number of acres used to grow industrial hemp in South Dakota, and some are even adding fiber and seed processing capabilities in state. Fiber processing facilities or decortication plants are expected to open in Wakanda and Winfred this fall. Ken Meyer, vice president of A.H. Meyer and Sons in Winfred, and John Peterson, owner of Dakota Hemp in Wakanda, will be the first fiber processing facilities to open in South Dakota. Here's a story coming out of Kentucky. This one's on WKYUFM.org. It says that Kentucky State Committee advances bill banning intoxicating Delta-8 THC derived from hemp. The story says a Kentucky Senate committee advanced legislation this past Tuesday that aims to ban intoxicating products derived from hemp, including a compound getting nationwide attention called Delta-8 THC. The FDA warned last year that the synthetic process utilized to manufacture Delta-8 THC sometimes uses potentially unsafe household chemicals and that the products aren't approved or evaluated by the FDA. One hemp processing company founder told the committee that he would be forced to move his business to Tennessee if the Delta 8 THC ban became law. Here's a story from hempgrower.com. It says that legislation in California and Utah would open pet access to hemp and cannabis. 
The story says that two proposed bills, one in Utah and the other in California, would give veterinarians greater freedom to discuss hemp and cannabis-based medicines with animals' owners. Senate Bill 209 in Utah would clarify that licensed veterinarians are not prohibited from discussing the effect of cannabis on an animal with the animal's owner, according to the bill text. This includes treatments with THC or other cannabinoids from industrial hemp or medical cannabis. Meanwhile, Assembly Bill 1885 would give veterinarians the right to discuss and recommend cannabis and cannabis products as medicine or supplements for pets. This bill would protect veterinarians from disciplinary or financial penalty for discussing cannabis-based treatments with pet owners. It also proposes veterinarian board certified guidelines and cannabis industry quality control standards and guidelines to be developed and followed. Back in May of 2020, I interviewed Dr. Patty Mayfield, a veterinarian in Oregon, and I was surprised to learn from her that veterinarians aren't even allowed to discuss medicinal cannabis for their pets like it's against the law for veterinarians to even talk about it with you know like the dog's owner or the cat's owner or whatever uh so um i'm happy to see that this is uh starting to get some some traction at least in utah and california All right, also some news coming in that uh, industrial hemp company Santa Fe Farms has rebranded itself as Element 6 Dynamics to reflect its focus on addressing Earth's carbon imbalance at scale. In a press release from the company, uh, it says that Element 6 Dynamics nature-based solutions will transform 1 million acres of industrial hemp to impact global paper, plastics, and protein industries. All right, good luck with that. Element 6 Dynamics, we're all rooting for you. All right, and finally, here's a story out of Colorado. This one's on the timescall.com website. It says that NOCO Hemp Expo is making a last-minute venue change. The NOCO Hemp Expo, previously held in Loveland before outgrowing its former home in 2019 and moving to Denver, is again changing venues, this time just weeks before the event is scheduled to kick off. The expo, which is in its eighth year, will now be March 23rd through March 25th at the Gaylord Rockies Resort and Convention Center in Aurora. NOCO Hemp Expo was previously set to be held at the Crown Plaza Denver Convention Center, but that site is no longer available because of an ongoing government humanitarian program taking place at that venue, organizers said in a press release. Founder of the Expo, Morris Beagle, said something to the effect of, you know, if there's one thing we know how to do in the hemp space, it's pivot. That's what they're going to do. And so uh, from what I understand, you know, like if you had made reservations at the old convention center, hotel, whatever, all of that has been transferred to the new location. So uh, they've got you covered there at NOCO. All right, I'll have links to all of these stories and more on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. All right, so like I said in the beginning, I just got back from the National Farmers Union Convention in Denver, Colorado, where they gave me an award for, what is it? Excellence in Agricultural Journalism. So quite an honor. Um, and I have covered Farmers Union events before, Pennsylvania Farmers Union in particular. Uh, but this trip to Denver was like an amazing immersion in, in what they're all about. You know, I was uh, attending panel discussions and, you know, policy meetings. And just it was a fantastic look into what this organization does. And a lot of what they do just resonates with, you know, who I am as a person and what I do as a journalist. You know, when I ask questions like, how does a hemp farmer avoid getting the short end of the stick? You know, it's that sort of thing. Um, the National Farmers Union is pro-farmer, pro-family farm, pro-small farmer. They are dead set against, you know, the monopolies coming in and taking over. And uh, yeah, there's a lot there that resonates with me personally. So it really was an honor to be recognized by the National Farmers Union for the work I'm doing here. And so while I was there, one of the people who spoke was Montana Senator John Tester. And he, he gave a great presentation about some, 
you know, farmer-friendly bills that he's putting forth. Uh, his one of his main concerns is the the meat packing industry and how there's there's just not enough capacity right now because all of the the meat packers are owned by like four major companies. So it's just crazy. And so I was able to catch up with the senator uh, right after his presentation. Hey, Senator Tester. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Can I ask a quick question? Sure, absolutely. So I'm Eric Herlock from Lancaster Farming Newspaper in Pennsylvania. Good. I wonder if you could speak to the potential of industrial hemp to revitalize rural America. Oh, it's got tremendous opportunity. I mean, I think the, the challenge we have in Montana, I don't know what it's like in Pennsylvania, but the challenge we got is processing. Now, there's some processing plants going on. But look, it's a crop within the rotation that fits really well in our ecosystem. And there's, there's some real opportunity here to, to add some value and to increase some farmers' bottom line. Yeah, and your state's sort of a leader in the uh, hemp seed for livestock yeah. feed. Yeah, no, look, I mean, it, it, you, back in the good old days, it was used for a lot of things. It's time really to go back to the good old days and start making some stuff out of hemp. It's renewable, and it, it, it lasts forever. I mean, it's, it's good stuff. Yep. We just need to be able to get a process. Look, the one that's going in a little town called Fort Benton, not far from me, I mean, they're going to do all sorts of things once they get this thing set up, to, from dashboards to cars to be able to pour concrete, utilize an industrial hemp, to be able to get it so you can make clothes out of it. So it's, it's, it's a win-win for rural America. That's right. He said it's a win-win for rural America. All right. So one of the other people that I had the chance to talk to in Denver was Colorado Commissioner of Agriculture Kate Greenberg. Now, I first became aware of her back in 2019 when she was on a USDA listening session call uh, about hemp. And, you know, everybody was given their viewpoints. This was before the USDA had their, even their interim final rule out. And, you know, her, her response was just, just perfect. You know, she hit all the nails on the head about, you know, what needed to be done in the hemp space. So if you want to hear that episode, it's episode 27 from uh, March 20th, 2019. Anyway, I'm a big fan of Commissioner Greenberg and uh, it, it was an honor to get to, you know, to meet her in person and to conduct this short interview. So I'm here with Colorado Agriculture Commissioner Kate Greenberg. Hello. Hi there. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm curious if you could tell me how hemp fits into like the overall goals for agriculture in Colorado. Yeah. So, you know, we we have three big goals at Colorado Department of Ag, uh, economic and supply chain resilience, uh, advancing voluntary stewardship and supporting the next generation. So hemp is, you know, in the middle of all three of those. Uh, we are on the hemp side in particular, focused on diversifying market opportunities for our hemp producers, really looking at fiber uh, and other market channels for Colorado Ag um, to look to. And then of course, supporting next generation. Uh, hemp is a lower water use crop. That's something we're very much up against in Colorado. How do we reduce water consumption while keeping ag alive and vibrant? Hemp can be one of those solutions. Right. Do you see that hemp is bringing in new, like younger people into agriculture? I think there's certainly an interest from a younger generation. Um, that generation has interest in other crops too, but I think the opportunities around hemp um, are just, they draw in people who want to problem solve, right? Because it is such a new industry. It'll bring in entrepreneurs who are comfortable uh, existing in a space that's still yet to mature. Right, right. Um, what is your department doing to sort of ensure the success of the fiber and grain side of the industry? Well, step number one was getting our state plan approved. Uh, we had a big process, two years stakeholder engagement while USDA was finishing their rules. Really proud of our work there. We worked very closely with USDA to make sure the final rules were ones we could live with. Um, from there, we've really been focusing on market development. We've got a whole market branch at CDA. And so we do recruitment with companies. We do business development with companies. Uh, Governor Polis has a budget request in for decortication in the state of Colorado. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I think all of that is creating uh, a diversified marketplace, but a sustainable marketplace and a sustainable regulatory structure. And that's what we're aiming for here. Um, how do you see hemp fitting into, you know, your, the department's goals for sustainability? As like I mentioned, this you know sustainability stewardship are one of our leading goals here. So when we think about developing a new industry, we always are also thinking about how can we advance the stewardship um, of that industry. Uh, so looking back at you know I mentioned water, um, soil health, carbon, 
uh, climate resilience. That is all a priority for us here in Colorado. So as we develop the hemp industry, we're looking for visionaries, entrepreneurs who are also thinking along the same lines of stewardship and sustainability and how we tie production uh, and the whole supply chain back to those values. Okay. So are you putting the call out to people outside of Colorado to come here? Absolutely. We're a hemp state. Come here, build your business, and uh, we want to help get it off the ground and and be the leader in the country for this work. Um, Is there anything else that listeners should know about hemp in Colorado? You know, every day I find more uses for hemp. Um, I've actually just got some bottle openers I'm going to go pick up that are made out of hemp. We had a concert a few months ago where the guitar uh, that the band was playing was made out of hemp. Was Maura Spiegel involved? Uh, Quite possibly. (laughs) Uh, Hemp table hempcrete, hemp milk, um, you know, I think the more that the industry matures, the more interest consumers are going to have and just the, you know, the population is going to have on the potential of growing this product. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time. It's nice to meet you today. Likewise. Thank you. All right. That's Kate Greenberg, Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Colorado. Yeah. So super cool convention. I got to, you know, just talk farming with people from all over the country and, uh, The reason I was there was that the people from the Pennsylvania Farmers Union nominated me for this this award. You know, they've been watching the work that I've been doing here on the podcast and the work that we do at Lancaster Farming Newspaper. And uh, yeah, so I appreciate that. And the, the, the past president of the Pennsylvania Farmers Union is Heidi Secord, but she was recently appointed to a position at the Farm Service Agency. And so there in Denver, I was able to catch up with Heidi Secord, who is Pennsylvania's new FSA executive director, and her boss, Zach Dujano. He's the, the top administrator for FSA, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to share this interview with you. Zach Dujano and Heidi Secord, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you both doing today? Doing great. Thank you so much for asking us to be here. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, an honor. And so um, I wondered if maybe you could each give me a brief introduction. Zach, you start? Sure. I'm Zach Dushan. I'm the administrator at the Farm Service Agency. I came on last year, the 22nd of February, so I've had just over a year at the job. I'm a third generation cattle rancher from the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. And I worked for the Intertribal Agriculture Council previous to this job. Okay. Heidi? Hi, I'm Heidi Secord, and uh, I'm the new state executive director for FSA in Pennsylvania. And I am the former state president of Pennsylvania Farmers Union. My husband and I run a, a diverse vegetable operation in northeastern Pennsylvania at the Josie Quarter Farm. Okay, well, congratulations on your new position. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, So I wonder if you could first just tell me what the FSA is. What is the Farm Service Agency? The Farm Service Agency is really the producer-facing aspect of the United States Department of Agriculture, along with our sister agency, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We provide on-the-ground assistance in over 2,000 county offices delivering safety net programs, delivering price support programs, delivering very important loan programs and disaster programs, as well as conservation reserve program, one of the biggest conservation programs in the world. Okay. So you said you've been here about a year in this position. Um, How's that going so far? I love this job, and I left my dream job to come to it, so that should tell you something. I really appreciate the team that I get to work with. We've got staff all across the country that are just top notch. We had a chance to see a couple of those offices today. We were in Adams County and Weld County, Colorado. Saw some of the dedicated staff in their element and it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to be part of a great team and to bring some leadership and vision it really is supported very much by Secretary Vilsack and the President to maybe re-examine the way we deliver these services to producers. What sorts of changes do you think are uh, that you're talking about? To me, the biggest change is the fact that the Secretary has charged us with finding flexibility in our programs 
and discretion in our programs and exercising it to the benefit of the producers. Take us out of a gatekeeper role of the taxpayer dollars and make us stewards of taxpayer dollars charged with getting the, getting the money out to where it's intended. Okay, what are some of the biggest issues facing uh, producers in America? Right now, we're still in a global pandemic and we are recovering from the economic impacts of that. We've got global unrest with uh, Russia invading the Ukraine. We've got input prices that are escalating, some legitimately tied to supply chain issues, some that are just rank and ripe profiteering by corporations. So the producer, as usual, is going to bear the brunt of all of these impacts. And our job here at the Farm Service Agency and our goal is to help empower our producers to have the economic choice to weather this and give them the opportunity to come out the other side and reposition their, their farm or ranch or grove or whatever they might be growing to take advantage of whatever comes next and continue to feed and clothe our country and the world. Okay. Um, Heidi, you're very new in the role. What, what do you expect your new job to be, to be like? What, what, what are some of your goals? What are some of the challenges that Pennsylvania producers are facing? Yeah, I'm, so I'm three and a half weeks into uh, my new role in, in Pennsylvania. I have a great team uh, at the state office and um, amazing teams out in our counties, um, which, you know, really needs some um, development and s more staffing um, to help serve our producers uh, in, our, in our counties and throughout our state. So really I see our, our first role of like really sitting down and listening to our county offices, listening to our producers to find out where we can improve programs in Pennsylvania uh, so that we can make those adjustments and making sure that we're serving not just our traditional farmers in Pennsylvania but also our new diversified uh, new generation farmers both in rural, peri-urban and urban areas. So making sure that we're um, reaching out to them and giving them the chance to be able to participate in the same programs that our rural partners are, are able to partake in. Okay. Um, so you bring to the job many years experience you know, working on different boards and various groups. Um, but I think maybe the most important experience is your work on the farm um, and regenerative agriculture practices on the farm. Can you talk a bit about that and why that's important that you're bringing this to this job? Well, thanks for asking that question. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I do. I bring 26 years of experience in, in farming and agriculture. I started out working for other people, and, and then oh, about 16 years ago is when I started uh, my own operation in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. And so, you know, I've learned so much from so many different types of farmers uh, throughout the state. I've through my other work with, as former state president of Pennsylvania Farmers Union, I had the opportunity sitting on the National Farmers Union Board to travel throughout the country and to really see how other farmers, um, the challenges that they have, um, the scope of their farms, you know, from our farm, which is, you know, 15 acres to, you know, large farms that are like 50,000 acres in North Dakota, and really, you know, um, in talking with farmers is finding that common ground of knowing how much we want to um, protect our farms, protect the ground that we're growing our farms on. And so I think that's the common ground that we can come around. Um, and, and the ideas of supporting our, our farms, our, not just our farms, but our families too. Um, and so the strength of family farms um, and the idea of um, how do we sustain that? And coming from that, from the common ground, I think we can have more deeper dive conversations around um, um, more regenerative practices and then building some of our programs around more of those opportunities. Okay. Um, Zach, you said you're a third generation cattle farmer and you've done extensive work with the um, Cheyenne River Sioux tribe. Um, how has you worked with um, indigenous 
people and you know cattle ranching how has that you know uniquely qualified you to deal with the bureaucracy of a Washington DC agency I had the benefit of growing up on a cattle ranch with a set of parents that were very empowering and expected us to figure things out. So coming from that foundation and then going into a professional career, serving on the tribal council for my tribe from 2000 to 2004, seeing that policy change is important. Subsequent to that, going to work full-time for the Intertribal Ag Council, an organization that has built a reputation all across Indian country with all 574 federally recognized tribes for finding solutions. And we made a concerted effort in the 2018 Farm Bill to make sure that everybody in the country was aware that Indian country still had ag production and it's still a vital part of our communities. Because of a focused and successful advocacy effort, we got 63 provisions in the 2018 Farm Bill specifically related to Indian Country. How does that qualify me for the Farm Service Agency? A lot of the direction that we're taking in agriculture, this regenerative movement, the holistic approaches, soil health, frankly, that's what was going on on this continent when the Europeans came across. We've been doing it for years, and we still have a lot of indigenous communities that are poised to really demonstrate how that happened, how it can happen again, how vital it is to having a circular economy. I mean, the secretary talked about a circular economy the other day in the House Ag Committee, and it, it really resonates with me and with what we are trying to do at the IAC when I was there and now what I think we need to do with the Farm Service Agency in our rural communities. We've got to find the means to help our producers be able to add value to their product in their community so that it inures to the benefit of that community and not just some outsider who's taking it, taking the profit with them and never spending any of that money back in that community. Can you explain more of that concept <clears throat> of a circular economy? Let's take beef on my home reservation of the Cheyenne River Sioux. We raise 40,000 of the best beef cattle in the country every year. They leave our reservation at about five months of age, go into the commodity beef market, are hauled thousands of miles to be fed and processed and sold, yet in the throes of the pandemic, our tribally owned grocery store was devoid of beef. Our shelves were empty. A circular economy would have a processing facility there, employing local people, so that you're, you're selling a product from your community instead of a commodity for someone else to turn into a product. And that's just a, a real Real plain example, I think, Eric, and there are others, you know, wheat growers, Senator Tester told a story the other night how his small town in Montana had three grain elevators, and now they don't have one. So their product is leaving their ecosystem and going to some other ecosystem where it's probably having a negative impact instead of being turned into a viable product there. And that's, you know, I really like what Heidi's doing and other folks like that at the, in that CSA-based, vegetable-based endeavor. They're, they're building those micro-circle economies. You know, all of the development's happening right there. The money stays in the community and can turn over and grow. And I think that we've got to try to find a way to replicate that on a more regional and sub-regional level than what we do right now. Can you point to a cause of this like non-circular economy? Like how did we get to this point where there's you know, no grain elevators in that town that you know, once had Absolutely, three. corporate greed. Consolidation of agriculture. 
Yeah. <laughs> and the ability of corporations with a preferred tax rate to be able to make money off the labor of others unfettered is the root cause of the problem. Is there anything you can do at FSA to alleviate that or to circumvent that? Or There's, is that like a <coughs> excuse me, like a legislative thing or policy, executive policy? There's a lot of work going on across the department to find the levers that we can pull with regard to that. Our role at the Farm Service Agency as I see it is to help empower producers to have more economic freedom based on their existing production income to be able to take part in the initiatives of the administration. Climate Smart Ag is a great idea, but we have to find a way for a producer that's doing customary ag to convert their production income into these solutions instead of waiting for the federal government to roll out a program. That doesn't exist right now. Our role at the Farm Service Agency is to help pr provide producers other income streams until we can get them that fair share of their production. Okay. Um, I've met enough farmers to know that they're sometimes distrustful of government agencies, federal government agencies in particular. What would you say, either Heidi or Zach, what would you say to those farmers about FSA's work? You know, the experience that Heidi and I got to have today, going out and seeing those county officials, the work that they've done in the last couple of years, have those farmers go and visit with those folks and see what their reality has been like for the last couple of years because we all want that face-to-face -face interaction at our local offices, but our staff have found a way to deliver I estimate 160% of normal programs while managing their household, while homeschooling their kids, while setting up an office in their basement or their extra room or maybe right at their kitchen table. If that doesn't move the needle on trusting those people, I'm fresh out of ideas how, but we're going to continue to do it anyway. Um, so this is a hemp podcast, ostensibly anyway. Um, how do you see the work you're, or does the work you're doing intersect with the hemp industry at all, or what does your agency do to help, you know, support this developing industry? Right now, I don't see us doing a heck of a lot in the hemp space, and there are challenges that are the result of decades of flawed federal policy with regard to hemp. Making hemp legal should have never been an issue to start with. And it should have been as easy as saying, well, let's just do what we were doing in the 1900s. Because hemp was a viable ag product that had many industrial uses, and we stopped doing it for no good reason. We should have just rolled back the clock a little bit. Because of the approach that was taken instead of that, we now have regulatory issues around a crop that shouldn't be regulated. Producers forcing to, being forced to burn their production in Tennessee just this week. Tribal producers hauled, trying to haul this product across Oklahoma getting arrested. Probably as many different state regulatory mechanisms as there are states in the union for a product that's harmless. And at, it, it's where we struggle to serve producers is, <coughs> excuse me, we've got to be able to securitize what we finance. So we can't even really finance hemp unless a producer has everything else we need to securitize it in other production. So it really puts us in a poor position. And I think there's a lot of good work that can be done within existing law, but from my personal perspective, it just doesn't make any sense to have hemp be in a regulated space. Heidi, want to add anything to that? Mm, no, there's nothing I need to add. Thanks. Yeah. You better jump in. I'll talk all day, I'll, given I'll, a chance, Heidi. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I mean, I just think, you know, like, especially with hemp, I mean, there's so many opportunities for it to be um, 
uh, um, for intercropping um, and also just for mixing in with other types of cover crops that are being used on farms. And so i um, not sure if NRCS would be able to, you know, with some of their um, mixes that they have of programs, how, how that might be. But until, again, until it's deregulated, I mean, there's nothing. Right. Um, so there's a movement um, to get you know, hemp grain approved as a livestock feed. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of people pushing back against that. Um, what would you say to, to that issue? It's like it's, it's legal and safe to feed to your baby, you know, your human children, but you can't feed it to your, your livestock. <laughs> so that's a loaded question. I mean, there's a, a lot of momentum towards existing ways of feeding livestock in this country. And it benefits a lot of corporate interests. So to have a presumably easy to grow, viable alternative might not be something that that momentum is going to be affected by. I, in my previous role, my position was, for goodness sake, just make hemp legal and be done with it, get it over with, so we can get back to the business of feeding and clothing people. Because in Indian country, it was a distraction because the economic hardships are so tangible and palpable on a daily basis for Indian producers, the next new thing looks like the best thing. And now as a result of that, we got bales of hemp sitting around mm -hmm. from the first year it was legal to grow that haven't been processed. And all we did was create another version of the same extractive economies that we talked about earlier. Hopefully we can get some infrastructure to make that hemp a more valuable product and take it out of that commodity sector so that we can avoid doing that to a bunch of other producers who are looking for alternatives. And similar things happened in Pennsylvania as well. I mean, lots of growers ended up with a lot of hemp in their barns too and ended up molding and that's the worst thing that can happen. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so getting back to regenerative ag practices and um, as it relates to soil health and climate change, can you speak to um, FSA's position on climate or carbon? Yeah, I sure can. And Heidi, I told you, I will talk all day given a chance. FSA is exceptionally pleased to see that we are no longer in denial that climate change is a reality. And we're happy to be at the leading edge of that with other folks in the department, building solutions that will empower the producers to take advantage of their efforts in climate change. Part and parcel of that is making sure that we are aware that there have been some early adopters out there and finding a meaningful way to engage them for helping to remind us that that existed. But we've also got to continue with the voluntary and incentive-based system that gives producers another choice. You know, we've, the rest of the department is, is working on the Climate Smart Commodities Program, where we're going to try to find a market, develop a market, help organizations develop markets for products that have that climate smart production behind them. So there's a lot that we can do. The FSA is glad to be at the, at the forefront with our team at the Department of Agriculture. And we look forward to more conversations in the future with our stakeholders because our position has been built by stakeholder input. We didn't just decide in January 2021, we're going to go out and do this to folks. We had uh, requests for input with hundreds and hundreds of diverse stakeholder responses. And that's how we built out our climate smart portfolio. And we're really proud of the work we've been able to do. Look forward to more. So the, the times that we live in are very like politically <clears throat> divisive. You know, it's like the most partisan time I, I mean, that I've ever witnessed in my life. Um, what are the, like, the bipartisan or nonpartisan issues in agriculture? Agriculture is bipartisan, I mean. 
when you think about it, it's we all eat. Um, what becomes politicized, I think, is um, I think when people demonize uh, all different types of farmers, whether you know uh, conventional farmers are demonizing organic growers or organic growers, or, you know, it's like we are only one percent of the population. And so we better work together. Listen, agriculture is national security. And, and so we need to figure this out. Uh, we need to find the common ground to have these conversations and talk about how we can support our growers in this country, how to feed and, and clothe our nation. So um, I, I don't know what Zach has to say about that, but I mean, those are my deeper thoughts around, around sure. that issue. Well, I, I think it's true. Ag on an aspirational level is bipartisan, but there are significantly partisan approaches. And our approach is all farmers are important and we want to include them. The previous administration said, get big or get out. So we're doing work to be inclusive in our program delivery and to shift the paradigm of the work of our producer, of our staff to stewards of taxpayer dollars towards the need as opposed to gatekeepers to prevent something new from happening. But, you know, aspirationally, it's certainly bipartisan. Everybody likes the notion of a small or a beginning or a young farmer. But I think we really have to look at where the rubber meets the road and are we doing that on a bipartisan basis? And in some cases, we are. Uh, Senator Tester did say that he feels like he's got bipartisan support for some of his initiatives around the beef packing industry. We've got the President of the United States convening meetings around that when the previous president gave it lip service and allowed JBS to gain ownership of one of our big meat packers. So I think that the bipartisan approach has to start where we're at because we're in the right place. All right, so I'm um, interviewing you both here in Denver, Colorado. We're at the uh, National Farmers Union Convention. Um, is there anything you'd like to say either about the convention or how maybe joining the Farmers Union might be beneficial for folks in the hemp industry? I would say joining the Farmers Union is beneficial regardless what industry you're in. Producers have to do a better job of taking a role in policy making and in decision making. In addition to joining your National Farmers Union, get out there and get on your county commission. Get out there and get elected to your FSA county committee. If you're interested in off-farm work, take a look at usajobs.gov because we need your help. Find a way to be engaged so that your voice is heard. Go to a farmer's market in a city. Share your story. Because the apparatus that is Big Ag is keeping the consumer from the producers. And producers want to grow what the consumers will buy. Consumers want to be able to inform the producer what they're willing to pay more money for. But it's like the wizard at the Wizard of Oz, it's behind the curtain. We don't get to see each other and have that interaction. So producers, get involved, get engaged, get to know a consumer, join these organizations that have values and a moral compass that align with yours. And consumers, if you're listening, go out there and visit a farm, talk to a farmer. Learn where your food is coming from and learn how little of that money you're spending gets back to the typical producer. And if you're not at the table, you're what's for dinner. That's right. <laughs> well, I think we'll end it there. Very good. Zach and Heidi, Thanks. thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. It's been good, Eric. Thank you. There you go. How about that? If you're not at the table, then you're what's for dinner. Ouch. Get involved, people. All right, anyway, that's the show for today. Thank you for listening. 
Hope you enjoyed my little trip to Denver. I know I did. If you're ever in downtown Denver, get one of those little scooters. I had so much fun cruising around on my, on my Lime scooter. And thank you to the National Farmers Union for the recognition and the hospitality in Denver. It's really a great organization, and uh, I was happy to be there with you all. Anyway, my name is Eric Harlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. If you ever have an idea for a story or you, you just want to talk about hemp or whatever, send me an email. Send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com. All right, until next time, I will see you in the newspaper. Industrial hemp. This episode of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2022 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, which is part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited, and produced by yours truly, Eric Herlock. Any music you hear throughout the show, as always, is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow.